Well, good morning, Vertical Church. I pray that your week is well. I pray that you're healthy. So excited as today we're getting into part number nine of our current sermon series, Alive. I pray that you've been blessed by this series so far as we've been walking through the book of James, learning about a faith that lives. I want to make sure that your faith is strong, your faith is, is alive. And so we're going to get into that today. But before, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that your love for us is so true. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that we hear your heart above anything else. God, I thank you, Lord, that you, you took the time to make sure we would know your word through Scripture. Lord, now make that Scripture come alive to us. Lord, I pray as always that you would make me as this microphone, that I would simply magnify the things you've said into me. Humble your manservant now, God. Let this word be good seed sown into the hearts that is good soil to produce a harvest in our lives. And Father, we'll be so humble to give you the glory, the praise, and the honor. Lord, I pray right now that someone's life is changed by your word. Father, we love you, we bless you, and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, amen. Well, guys, listen, last Sunday, we moved right into part number eight. We talked about a humble faith. Hope you remember this, a humble faith. Faith. And we started our sermon last Sunday actually talking about what it means to have a stable faith. And a part of having a stable faith is that you must drop the anchor of humility. You remember I told the story of the young man that had sailed all night and he sailed to his port and he woke up in the morning and his ship was out to sea. The night before he made the critical mistake and he forgot to drop his anchor. Now, it's very important to understand this, that in order for your faith to remain stable, you're going to have to drop your, your anchor. This anchor creates stability for our lives in our faith. And if we're not careful, if we don't have an anchor of humility, we will, we will drift off. Yeah, things will happen. Uh, our, our desires arouse up. We talked about that last week. Uh, our, our devotions to other things will, will become stronger and we will drift away in our faith from God. And so I want to make sure that we understand this today because last Sunday we talked about a humble faith. Listen, I got to be honest with you. We're going to keep moving forward in the same idea because we're talking about a humble faith again. Actually, today is going to be a humble faith part two because I believe that James continues in this understanding for the reader that we must have the anchor of humility if we are going to have a, a faith that remains. I want you to understand this, that humility is not something that you do, it's something that you become. This idea of being humble. And what I want to make sure that we understand this, that, that as James is continuing in these verses today, that, that he understands, listen, humility is not something that you do. It's something that you become over time. It's the outgrowth of your relationship with God. This is why last Sunday we talked about the solution that James says, listen, submit yourselves unto God. If you want to have the outgrowth of humility in your life, you must submit yourself unto God. And today, I really want to unpack this because I believe for all of us, we constantly need an adjustment in our perspective, an adjustment in our understanding, an adjustment of the, the clarity of what I call reality. And that starts with humility. And the first thing that we have to be humble about, we have to be humble before the Lord. So today, we're going to work from the last verse that we left with last Sunday. Verse number 10, I want you to go there. James chapter number 4, verse number 10. I believe that the centrality of this chapter rests on this verse. Here it is. It says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. James chapter number 4, verse number 10. This is what we're going to hang our hat on today. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt exalt you. It's right there. Here's, here's where this transition for us today. Last Sunday we talked about our desires and what we want gets us into trouble, but, but here is the part of the story with the young man who drifted away to sea. He forgot to, here it is, drop his anchor. You got to catch this. That humility is your work. Listen to me. That, that being humble is your effort. You, you have to do the work of dropping your anchor. Yeah, you have to drop your anchor. You have to make sure, God, help me remain humble. This is why we encourage you to pursue your private time with God, why you pursue uh, your, your, your journaling, your prayer time, your studying of the Bible, hearing God's voice, because you want to make sure you're doing your part to remain humble. 
Listen, the man on the ship, it was nobody else's responsibility to drop the anchor. It was his. There is nobody else that's responsible for making sure that you're humble except you. You have a part to play. And in this verse, James breaks it down so clearly. Humble yourselves. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And and he will exalt you. You got to see this because I think one of the things we got to catch before we move too fast in the text is that one of the challenges that James is struggling with here with the church is a lot of the division, a lot of the disobedience, a lot of the sin that we have in our life is because we exalt ourselves. And listen to this. This is the tough part. It's not just exalting ourselves over others. Yeah. It's not just exalting ourselves over our enemies. But some of the time, we exalt ourselves over God with the decisions that we make, the way we make our plans. Watch this. Even the way we treat other people. I'm going to show it to you in the text tonight. That that we exalt ourselves over God. James says, "This, this type of walk for a Christian is a walk that will not be submitted to the will and the work of God, which will lead to disobedience. The idea here is that James says, listen, if you humble yourself, God, I love it, God will exalt you. You got to catch that, that when you humble yourself, God will exalt you. I don't know about you, but I would rather have God exalt me than me exalt me. Y'all ain't with me. That, That I would rather, instead of me doing the hard work of trying to make me seem great and me get what I want and put myself over others, no, I would rather humble myself. And let the God of the heavens and the earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars, I would rather he be the one that exalt me in time and season. So today, I want to address this issue for us because for so many times, we don't even realize that we are walking trying to exalt ourselves over God. So I want to give it to you one more time. Our big idea is the same as it was last Sunday. Uh, I believe this is still true, and it's going to apply to this text as well. A faith that lives remains stable by what? With an anchor of humility. With the anchor of humility. So let's get some context here. Again, remember that James is writing to the church. And in his writing, he's addressing some of the issues in the church, primarily the disunity in the church, the, the division in the church. And he's, he's addressing this idea of humility, And this idea of us being humble, and he's addressing this issue of being double-minded. And he continues in his effort to address the humility in the life of the believer. Now, i got to be honest here. James changes his tone because he goes from talking about sinners and double-minded. If you remember, we go back to verse number one. He addresses sinners. He calls the reader a sinner, the double-minded. But now his tone is coming just a little different as he's very pastoral, very shepherding in his language. He says, now, brothers and sisters, he's talking this relationship because he wants us to really grasp the importance of us being humble. He's actually referring back to verse number six, if you guys remember. He says, but he gives more grace. Verse number six of chapter number four, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives to the humble, gives grace to the humble. He says, but God, listen to me, church, he opposes the proud. You got to see this, that it's our pride that puts us in opposition of God. Why would this be? Because pride will always put you over God. Yeah, yeah. Pride will keep you from submitting to God. I'm going to unpack it here in just a moment. But he, he opposes the proud. Luke chapter number 14, verse number 11. Jesus says this, for everyone who exalts himself, watch this, will be humbled. And he who humbles himself, watch the text, will be exalted. I'm just trying to give you some verses to understand where James is coming from is why it's so important. First Peter chapter number five, verse six. Watch the text. Peter says, humble yourselves. If you got your Bible, it's a comma there. That, that's a work in itself. That's, that's a growth track in itself. That's, that's a sermon. Humble yourselves. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, watch the text, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. What do we hear here? That that one of the challenges that we have is that we have the temptation, every single one of us, to exalt ourselves. 
I know what you're saying. Well, Pastor, that's not me. You know, I, uh, uh, I don't think that much of myself. I, I'd rather be in the background. I'm, I'm an introvert. No, no, no. I'm not talking about how you deal with other people. I'm talking about how you live your life. The temptation to exalt yourself is before all of us. And we have to do the hard work every single day to press into God and drop the anchor of humility. Yeah. James goes to great lengths to make sure we understand that the anchor that we need in our faith is humility. Yet he addresses this from some different and interesting angles and perspectives. Matter of fact, the next few verses that we're about to unpack, many people call these high-risk areas of our lives that we tend to overlook, that we realize that we don't have humility in. These are areas that shape how we walk out our life. And I think it's really important, as I'm going to take some time just in a few moments here, to unpack what, is these, what are these high-risk areas? What are these areas that we need to be humble in? What are the things that we need to make sure that we don't exalt ourselves in? The places and the people and even God. I want you to hear this in your spirit that, that you're not trying to exalt yourself over God. And I want us to watch how James breaks this down for the church. So there are three things he actually unpacks for us today. So uh, I want to give you this first one. I think is really important. So number one, we have to be humble with people. Yeah, we got to be humble with people. It's right here uh, in the text that, that he breaks this down right after verse number 10. 10 is the setup, right? And he begins to break this down. He says, number one, we have to be humble with people. I want you to see this. The absence of humiliation or humility will always lead to the sin of self-exaltation. Let's go to verse number 11 and 12. Let's read it. James chapter number 4, verses 11 through 12. Watch this. It says, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. Here's the question. It's a rhetorical one. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Yeah, we got to be humble with people. And let us be clear here. We were already addressed in this sermon series, the dangers of the tongue. Mm -hmm. James chapter number three, verse one through 12, we preach a sermon called a divided faith. That we, we say one thing to God, but we go to somebody else and say something else. This, this, this divided tongue that produces sweet and bitter water at the same time. No, it can't happen. Here it is that James said, listen, that when you speak evil against your brother, when you slander, Mm -hmm. When you are overcritical of somebody else, James says that in this effort, you have now become a judge of the law. Now, what law are you talking about, Pastor? What are you talking about? Well, let's, let's go back to Matthew chapter number 22, where the, the, the lawyer asks Jesus Christ, hey, what are the greatest commandments? What are the greatest laws? And Jesus responds is this, the great commandment to love your God, right? Love your, love your God with all your soul, your mind, and your strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So, so here's what he's saying. James is saying, listen, that when you slander, when you, when you talk about somebody else, when you, when you put your mouth on somebody else as a believer and you sit in a seat of judgment, when you sit in this, this seat of critique, what you're doing is you're actually breaking the law of love of your neighbor. You got to see this because let's all be honest. We all, I'm guilty as anybody of judging somebody else, but I got to realize that that place of judgment and critique and even slander talking about somebody else, that's from a place of arrogance. That's from a place of self-exalting. I wouldn't do that. I would never do that. I can't believe this happened. No, when you start talking about somebody, you are not acting in humility. You're sitting in the seat of judgment. He says it right here. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. So let me break this down for you. There are two transgressions that happen when you slander or speak against your brother in Christ. There are two transgressions. The first one, there was a transgression of the commandment of loving your neighbor. 
There's a transgression of the commandment of loving your neighbor. Let me be clear here that when you talk to somebody else about somebody else, you're breaking the commandment of loving your neighbor. I, I know right now we're, we're in this time where everybody got something to say on social media. You better be careful about the things you have to say. Let me just say this. Just because they are wrong does not give you the right to be a judge. Yeah, J- just because they are not in line and what, what you, it does not give you the right to slander. Mm-hmm. But the truth of the matter is that all of us don't get it right all the time. And see, I can appreciate those brothers and sisters in Christ in my life that instead of talking about me, no, they came to me. Watch this, in love. See, correction can be done in love, but slander is done in arrogance. Write it down if you can. Correction can be done in love, but slander is always done in self-exaltation and arrogance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, we have to be aware about the things that we say. We just said this just a moment, a few weeks ago. We talked about a divided faith and how the tongue in chapter number three. Go back and read it and how those words can light a brush fire. Just, just one small word can be a flame that starts something so big. See, I, I want us to make sure that we understand that it's our responsibility as Christians to walk as Christ. See, the Christian community also at that particular time needed the unity. Watch this. That slander often destroyed. If we're talking about all the time that there's this reconciliation between us and God and us and one another. Here at Vertical Church, we want to be a beautiful, multi-ethnic, multi-generational church that's pursuing unity under the gospel. Then slander will always divide us. What we have to say will always divide us. What we think towards others will always divide us. Let me say this very clearly. That no matter what a person has done, your slander, your judgment is not the answer. I'm not saying that we don't pursue correction. I'm not saying that we don't pursue justice. I'm not saying that we don't pursue reconciliation. But not at the expense where we're paying with slander. Mm -mm. See, I want to make sure that we understand this because I think the church has a real, real problem in this area of pride because the church at large, we have had the habit of looking down on people that don't live. Watch this. Not as the Bible says, but as we say. Yeah. Yeah, I I love what what John Wesley says. John Wesley says in his book, uh, he says, the lowest and the worst have a claim to our courtesy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't care your ethnic group. I don't care your gender. I don't care your economic status. I don't care your nationality. You have the courtesy and the claim to my courtesy as a believer because I am called to walk with you in love. Yeah, yeah. See, this judgment is always rooted in the place of arrogance And pride. Let's walk through the text here in Romans chapter number two, verses one through five. Uh, Come on, preach, Paul. It says, therefore, you have no excuse. Yeah. Oh, man, every one of you who judges for in passing judgment, watch this church on another. You condemn yourself. Watch it. Because you, the judge, practice the very same things. He says, listen, the very thing that you're judging somebody else for, you're doing something else that's breaking the law. So most times you're judging somebody else for a sinning. Well, definitely be clear, you have sin of your own. Yeah, yeah. He says this in verse number three. Excuse me. Verse number two, he says, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. I want you to hear this. The judgment of God. Man, this is tough. But trust me, God's, God's judging them. It's going to happen. He doesn't need you to be his his little judge. (laughs) God God does not need your assistance when it comes to to judgment. Verse number three says, do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourselves, that you will escape the judgment of God? He says, do you think that, that because you judge somebody and you have your own sin that God won't, watch this, judge you for your judgment, judge you for your sin? Yeah. Verse four, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you 
to repentance. He says, are you counting on the kindness of God towards you? Watch this, but not towards somebody else. Hear me. I want you to hear how pride and arrogance and exaltation rises up because many of us act like we're the only ones qualified for the grace of God. Man, when you become a judge of another person, when you become a person that speaks evil against or on somebody, you have just put yourself in the place of God and you say, listen, I'm worthy of grace. I'm worthy of forgiveness. I'm worthy of mercy. I'm worthy of this patience. I'm worthy of this kindness. And you just exalted yourself above somebody else. And James says, humble yourselves. And God, yeah, will exalt you. Verse 5, let's stay in the text here. But because of your hard and impotent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. See, I want you to see this, that the second transgression that we have, so first is against the law of love. The second transgression, this is, this is a tough one right here, is the transgression against the authority of of the law and the giver of the law. Here's the transgression. You got to see this. That when God's law says, love your neighbor as I have loved you, that's the command of Christ. The second commandment, that a great commandment, to love your neighbor as, as yourself. The moment you say, I know this, but I don't want to do it, you just judge the law. I want you to see this. Because what you have just said is, okay, God, uh, uh, I know what you say. Uh, I see that, but I think there's a better way. Matter of fact, there's a way that I think it should be done differently. In that moment, you just sized up the law of God, and you're like, nah, I ain't going to do that. I'm going to do something else. Let me give you an example. Uh, I remember my, my sophomore year at uh, the North Carolina a State University. I had the beautiful opportunity to get a job, praise God. And I remember my first job in Greensboro was at TJ Maxx on High Point Road. And the only job at the time that was available was I was there to unload the truck first thing in the morning. So I had to get there at like 5 o'clock in the morning. And I remember when I got there, there were some older ladies that had been working at TJ Maxx for years, working at TJ Maxx for years. And I remember that, that when I got there, they gave me my box cutter. This is my tool of choice. And they said, listen, you get a box cutter, cutter and you better be on time. That's the two things they said. You get a box cutter, you better be on time. But one of the older ladies was trying to show me how they unloaded the boxes and unloaded the truck. So we would unload the truck, and as we were unloading the truck, we would break down the boxes. Unload the truck, break down the boxes. Unload the truck, break down the boxes. And she gave me every single step. Young man, just do what I tell you to do. And I remember after about just being there maybe two or three days, I'm already in my mind trying to come up, watch this, with a better way. With a better way. And so here it is. I, I put my little idea together. If I do this and I put this here and I do this there, that, that this could be a smoother process. I'll never forget this. And, and I remember doing this. And the first time I tried it, I waited till no one else was around. And, and one of the old ladies, she was the manager in the back. She came back and saw what I had done. And she said, you done started a mess. And I said, what you talking about? You done, she said, you done started a mess. And sure enough, uh, everything was out of order. How things were normally set up to be ran out and placed out on the floor was all messed up. And here's what happened. I want you to see this. Then I ended up messing up some really serious stuff there. I got in trouble, and they said, why didn't you just do, watch this, what we told you and showed you to do? Can I tell you what it was? It was arrogance. <laughs> it was pride. Here's what, here's what I said. Listen, I know y'all been doing it this way a long time, but I, I see the way that you're doing it. I see what you're saying, but I have a better way. And what James says is that when you operate in this place of pride and self-exaltation and you become a judge of other people, when you get into the place where you are slandering and speaking evil and talking about and talking disrespectfully about or to other believers, then you have just said, you know what, God, this whole love your neighbor thing, I'm not down with that. I've got a better way. Matter of fact, I'm going to put myself, watch this, in the place of the judge. I want you to see this in the text. He says right here, he says, The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law. You speak evil against the law. This law is not good. It's terrible. God, you had a bad idea. What a terrible idea. He says, but if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law. Watch this church, but a judge. He's saying now, here's the second transgression. He's saying, listen, now you've taken God out of the seat 
of judge and you've now put yourself in the seat of judge. This is why in verse 12 he goes on further says this, there is only one lawgiver and one judge. Why? Because when you take the time to treat people the way you want to treat them, to, to, to see them the way you want to see them, for you to say, listen, I'm going to put you in heaven or I'm going to put you in hell. You, when you say you are a sinner or you are righteous, when you put yourself in that seat of righteousness, you have just replaced God. You have now exalted yourself to the status of God. James asks the question here, right here in the end of verse number 12. He says, but who are you to judge your neighbor? Who do you think you are to judge somebody else? You have usurped the place of God and made your judgment final. You got to drop the anchor of humility. I love what it says. Paul says in Ephesians chapter number four, verse 29, he says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those that hear. Who are you to judge? What are you saying? How are you using your words? What are you posting? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, let me give you Matthew chapter number 7, verse 2 through 4. Let me give you what Jesus said in his sermon. Here it is, verse number 2. So he says, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be the judge. By judging somebody else, you pronounce you'll be the judge. And with the measure you use it will be measured to you. Mm. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the law that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there was a log in your own eye? Let's be very clear. You don't have the right nor the responsibility to be judge. And I dare say in our context now, we have not only stepped into the place of judge, but we feel like we're called to be judge, jury, an executioner, watch this, of other people. And James says it very clearly, there is only one lawgiver and one judge. So the first place we got to be humble with what? People, you got to watch the stuff you say. And you, you watch how you say with what you, is in your heart. Let's move, let's move, let's move. Number two, number two, number two. Here it is. We got to be humble with people. Now we got to be humble with our plans. I'm just trying to show you different areas that we exalt ourselves. We, we exalt ourselves and we got to make sure we humble ourselves before the Lord so God can exalt us. It's right here. I believe this. Write this down if you can. There is pride in our plans. There is pride in our plans. James chapter number four, verse 13 through 17. James says this, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend year, spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you watch this church, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. I want you to see this very quickly because I know some of y'all say, well, Pastor, I, I don't know if I, I really exalt myself. Every single time you make a plan in your life, for your life, absent of the will of God, you've just exalted yourself. Hear, hear what I'm saying? That, that when you take the time to say, I'm going to make these grandiose plans, but I've never considered God. I'm going to make these plans, and I'm going to try to put these things uh, together. I, I can see this happening. I, I have vision for this, and, and I want to do this. But every time you do that, and you have not done this with the work and the hand of God on it, you have now just boasted in yourself. Because this is what you're saying. Oh, I know I'm going to be able to do this. Mm-hmm. I know in a year I'm going to be here, I'm going to make this, and, and I'm going to drive this, and I'm going to be married to this person, and I'm going to live here. You're making all these plans, but you haven't talked to God. And James says, what is your life? Do, do you even understand 
what your life is when you make all these grandiose plans. Your life is a mist that appears for a little time, then vanishes. In the grand scheme and the work of the hand of God, your life is a mist. Why would you make plans for your life that is a mist where God has been here from the beginning to the end? Let's see here. One one of the things that I call this is I believe this is one of the greatest traps that many believers get caught in. This is the trap of independence. The trap of independence. The independence trap nurtures your pride more than anything else. Let me say it again. Your independence trap, the trap of independence, the trap of I can do it myself, will, will quickly and surely, hear me church, will actually nurture your pride. All of us have been there where you wanted to do your things on your own. No, I can do it. Uh, uh, My children, seven and five, I remember early on, as soon as they could do it, I can do it by myself, daddy. I can do it by myself. And when you start having this attitude with your walk in Christ, listen to me, it's actually fertilizing your pride. It's actually nurturing this idea that you can actually do something on your own. And we often do this, and many of us don't think about this humility when it comes to how we plan our life. But how we plan our life is a very, very important place for us to consider. Am I humble there? Because let's be honest, I don't know about you, but I've been upset when God didn't submit to my plans. Okay, all right, all right. Uh, 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 Here it is, uh, that, that some of us make our plans like God doesn't even exist. Mm, Yeah. Yeah, some of us make our plans like God does not even exist. Do you make plans as if God does not exist? Yeah, here's a better question. Do you plan as if you exist for God, or do you plan as if God exists for you? Yeah. I got to be honest with you, many times in my life, I have failed this one terribly. That I have made my plans. I have put these things together. And I said, you know what? I'm going to take my plan and I'm going to put it before God and I'm going to demand that God bless it. (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to decree and declare this thing into existence. (laughs) Here it is. You got to be very careful with this because so many times when you do this absent of God, you are boasting in yourself. Let's be honest. If there is any time that we should be more aware of this, nothing like what we're going through right now during COVID-19. Some of us made some plans this year. There are so many people that didn't have the plan of having a, a worldwide pandemic shut their world down. And here it is again. James said, listen, what is your life? You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. We, we, we thought that the pandemic was gone and they had a resurgence. We, we, we don't know. And this should humble us. Let me give you my own personal testimony. Um, <laughs> it wasn't long ago that I, I and myself, I had some, some grand plans. Uh, uh, I said to myself, you know, last, last October, I said, you know what? Uh, uh, I want to do better about taking rest. I want to do better uh, with, with my family. Since I've been pastoring Vertical Church, Launch Vertical Church, seven years now, uh, I've been leaning into this so hard, but I, I haven't really taken time to take my children on a real vacation. So I said in October, I'm going to make a plan that in uh, August, we're going to go on a cruise. And I said, you know what, we're going to go on this cruise. And, and I started putting my little coins away, putting my little coins away. Uh, I got with a travel agency, and we were setting up arrangements, and I'm making my little payments and stuff. I hadn't even told my wife, here it is, because my plan was to go on a Disney cruise. Those things are crazy expensive. But I said, my wife, she loves Disney World, and, and even on our honeymoon, that's what she wanted to go for the honeymoon. I was like, babe, no, we're not going to Disney World. But here, I said, babe, I'm going to take you. I'm going to take you. We're going to do it. And so I put in this work, and I said, let you know what? I'm not even going to tell her. I'm going I'm to get all the flights. I'm going to get the, the best spot we can afford, and I'm going to tell her on our wedding anniversary in May. Y'all, COVID-19 hit. And um, my plans just fell apart in my face. Here's what's crazy. Can I be honest with you? I made those plans for me. 
I know, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, I said all the right things. Yeah, I need to rest and recover. It'd be good for my, for my children. It'd be good for my wife. Can I be honest with you, though? I made those plans for me. It was my pride that made those plans because I said in October, if I do this, I can watch this church. I can save the money. I can make the payments. And here it is. Watch this. I wanted to surprise my wife because I wanted, listen to me, I wanted my wife to love me more. Oh, she's going to love me. When I show her that we got tickets to go on a Disney cruise, my kids are going to say, oh, man, Dad, you are the best. Do you hear the pride and the arrogance and the self-exaltation even in a plan like that? What are your plans say? Is it about you? Are you making your plans as if you exist for God, or do you make your plans as if God exists for you? This, this self-centered living will, will produce a person that ignores the will of God. Let me show it to you right here in Proverbs 27, verse number 1. He says, do not boast about tomorrow. Watch this. For you do not know what a day may bring. We don't know what's going to happen. But when we try to plan our lives, we try to plan our weeks, our months, our years, even our days absent of God. It's us putting, exalting ourselves into the place of God. And here it is that scripture actually shows us this, that we, we can't do this. We, we, we cannot get into this place of not humbling ourselves. See, this is one of those things about the sin of commission and the sin of omission. A lot of us talk about the sin that we commit, but sometimes there are sins of omission. We not humbling ourselves to God. Sin. It's, it's right here. Uh, in the text, he says it right there in, in the last verse, verse 17. So whoever knows the right thing to do, listen to me, church, and fails to do it, for him it is sin. To know the right thing to do and to not do the right thing is sin. To not humble yourself before the Lord, to, to not submit, to say, God, I got some plans, like real talk, I got some stuff I think we need to do, but Lord, what do you want to do? We don't even understand the nature of human life, that it is so short, it is so fragile, it is a mist. And God says, how dare you? You put all these plans together, you weren't here in the beginning, and you won't be here in the end, and you didn't even ask me, but you want me to bless it, and then when I don't bless it, you get mad at me and said, and ask the question, God, how could you, how could you not plan your life without me? Yeah, yeah. See, many of us have busy schedules, and it's easy to plan those schedules without considering the will of of God. Many of us have visionary goals for our business, our jobs, our churches, and our family. And God wants us to watch this work diligently in all of those areas, but we must not do that absent of considering the will of God first. So for some of us, listen, this is a place we got to humble ourselves. We got to humble ourselves where we make our plans. Man. Because you think you, you know exactly what needs to happen. And, the, and, and I believe the most important thing is that every single day, constantly su submit yourself. God, what do you want? 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 I love what Jesus says in John chapter number 4, verse 34. John chapter number 4, verse 34. Jesus says this. Jesus said to them, watch this church, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. That is what nourishes me. What drives me, what fuels me is doing the will of God. This is what Jesus says. What, what I, I 
feast on, God help me, is to do the will of him who sent me and accomplish his work. Second Corinthians chapter number five, verse 17 through 20. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. We are now ambassadors for Christ. Nothing should satisfy us more than doing the will of God. God save me. God redeem me. God heal me. Why in the world would now that this new life that I have that I didn't save by myself why would I try to live my life through me God God I want to do whatever it is that you want me to do instead we boast in ourselves yeah and how we can plan absent of God second Corinthians chapter number 12 verse 9 says this but he said to me my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness Listen, church, we got to not boast in our gifts and our strengths and talents. No, boast in your weakness. Here it is. I will boast in my weakness because in my weakness, his power is made perfect. Let me show it to you. Galatians chapter number 6, verse 14. My D group is walking through Galatians right now. And verse number 14 says, but far be it from me to boast. Except in the cross, except in the cross, except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. There's anything that I want to boast in. I want to boast in the gospel. There's anything I want to boast in. I want to boast in the work of the cross. If there's anything that I want to boast in, it's in the shed blood of Jesus Christ that redeemed me. I don't want to boast in my own power. I don't want to boast in my own ability. I don't want to boast in my own strength. No. God help me to see the gospel every single day in every single place of my life that I would boast in that that I would simply say God I'm weak but you are strong God I don't know but God you know everything God I don't have the power but God you are sovereign humble yourself before the hands of the Lord and you won't have to exalt yourself. God will exalt you. Lastly, before we close here, number three, we want to humble ourselves with people. We want to humble ourselves with our plans. But lastly, we want to humble ourselves with our privilege. Be humble with our privilege. Let me be very clear here. That privilege is real. And every single one of us have a privilege of some kind. I'll say it again. Every single one of us have a privilege of some kind. It may be your experience. It may be your education. It may be your ethnicity. It may be your social economic status. It, it may be your national. You have a privilege of some kind. The question is, how do you use your privilege? How do you use your privilege? James chapter number 5, verses 1 through 6, we're, we're closing here. It says this, number 1, come now, you rich. Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have corroded. And their corrosion will be the evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have Fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Yeah, I know I just said a lot. Stay with me here. That, that James specifically now is talking to those that are of wealth. He's talking about those who are rich. And the problem in that day, they had the privilege of wealth, but they misused their privilege. They took advantage of other people. They didn't give people what they deserved. They looked at the privilege that they had as something that they owned and not something that they stewarded. Yeah, yeah, you have a gift, you have a talent, you have a privilege. 
You have something that you didn't even you didn't even earn, but it was God given. What you look like, how tall you are, your natural gifts and ability, the color of your skin can create privilege for you. The question is, how are you using your privilege? And the self-centered language of this text it is so important for us to realize because so many of us are self-centered with the things that we have. We're self-focused with the things that we have. He says, come now, you rich. He says, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. He said, listen, miseries is coming because you are self-exalted. He says, your riches have rotted. You put your, your focus on what you have. Let me tell you something, church. Every single thing that you can pursue in this earth, absent of God, will fade away. So your garments that you think are so important, the clothes that you think are so important, moss will eat them away. Your gold and silver, one day they'll corrode, and their corrosion will be the evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mold your fields. Watch this. Which you kept back by fraud, you were deceptive. You deceived. You, you, you should have done the right thing and you didn't. You, you took what God blessed you with and acted like it was yours. God help me. God help me. I, I know sometimes that some of us, we feel like, well, God, you gave it to me. But it's your job to steward whatever he gave you. Whether it's your money, your gift, your privilege, your time, your talent. You should say, God, what do you want me to do? got privilege <laughs> what do you want me to do you have influence and to not use your privilege to not use your talent to not use what God has gracefully given you so exalt oneself what that simply means is God you gave me this but listen I'm gonna use it the way I want to use it that's pride that's arrogance didn't God give it to you? You're using it for your gain. Listen, these verses, these six verses, they scream pride to treat others unfairly, to fatten yourself, to, to try to make what you have better, to cut corners for somebody else. That's out of arrogance and pride. And God is saying, listen, here it is, that if we don't do anything else, we have to make sure as a church, as followers of Jesus Christ, that we don't act this way towards others. Here's why. Because this is the complete opposite of the gospel. If we are called to represent Christ, how can we represent Christ if all we do is operate out of pride and arrogance and self-serving and self-indulgence and fattening ourselves. See, what we need is self-divesting contrition over self-resourcing accomplishments. God, I, I want to make sure that I I'm divesting myself. I want to make sure that I'm investing in the others. I want to make sure, God, that whatever you've given me, my calendar, my money, my time, my talent, Lord, the influence that I have, God, how do you want me to use it? Because y'all don't know this, but if you don't know yet, here it is. Jesus, that's what he did with his, his privilege. The fact that he lived a perfect life, he, he used it for you. The fact that he would be the perfect lamb to be slain. He, he humbled himself, the Bible says in Philippians chapter number 2, that he humbled himself as unto a servant, even unto death. He dropped his anchor. Yeah. See, with all the privilege that you have as, as a person of, of your nation, ethnicity, gender, income, time, education, training, whatever it is, how are you using it for the glory of God? And for you to not even ask God, how can I use what you've privileged me with? Screams pride. It's the lack. Watch this. I'm not just not humbling yourselves to other people, but humbling yourselves before the hand of the Lord. 
today, church, this is what we have to do. We've got to drop our anchor every single day. We've got to drop the anchor of humility. Because if we're not careful, you got to see this. The waves of life, the winds of our desires, the current of our flesh will take us away from the shore. We must drop our anchor. Jesus dropped his anchor for you and I. This is the good news. That where we could not pay the sin debt that we owed, Jesus says, I'm going to be humble enough to pay the sin debt. I don't deserve what you deserve. In the same way we are called to live our lives as Christians. In the same way we are called to live our lives as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ. Because the world needs to see some people that will drop the anchor of humility. God wants to see you drop the anchor of humility with him. Some of us exalt ourselves over others. Some of us exalt ourselves over God. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. That through your son, Jesus Christ, he, he dropped the anchor of humility. God, we've said it so many times that he, he left divinity and embraced humanity for sinners for those of us that are, that are considered enemies of you. That's what Jesus did. 